Praise the Lord, church. Who is glad to be in the house of the Lord today? I know I'm glad to be in here today. I came in with praise and thanksgiving in my heart. I'm looking forward to seeing what God's going to do in this place here today. I'm so excited to see what he's going to do. I'm glad today, Sister Penny. I am glad today to be in the house of the Lord. So thankful to be in here today. Amen, amen. It's good to see each and every one here today on this nice cold morning. So we're going to continue on with our lessons here in the Sunday School book. Uh, we're going to st- be on lesson 3.4, and we're still in the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 12, starting at verse number 1. And it says, I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Also, uh, Paul speaking here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 10. Maybe. There we go. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, which is straw, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall be rewarded. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defileth the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye? Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he had taken the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore... Let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cyphus or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Ye are Christ and Christ is God. The truth about God today is God calls us to build our lives upon him. The truth for my life is I, I will build my life upon Jesus Christ, that foundation upon Jesus Christ. Christ. So our lesson today is titled, A Reasonable Service. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let's ask him to open up our ears, open up our hearts, open up our souls to hear the word of God this morning, that we take the word of God spoken to us into our hearts, and that we use it for the upbuilding of his kingdom. Bless your people today, Jesus. Thank you. So today we're going to finish up with our very last lesson in the fall literature. We are moving into our winter literature. This has been our series on treasures in Romans. And as we started off here, Paul started off his letter to the Romans talking about the doctrine, which is what we started off, talking about the doctrine. His focus was based upon the doctrine. He wanted the people to know that. First and foremost, making sure all of his readers got the full understanding of the doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here toward the end of Romans, Paul starts, he switches from doctrine, and he starts talking about practical instructions for daily living. What we need to know for just the daily lives that we live. Things that Paul wanted the people in the church in Rome, wanted the church in Rome to know, to understand. But all at the same time... He was fulfilling God's purpose 
of having this available to us today, over 2,000 years later, so we could still glean information from this, to get those instructions of how to live our daily lives. So as we started off there in the scriptures, Paul, he wanted to base everything around one certain thing, and he did, he based it on the mercies of God. As we read about in Romans 12 and 1, he started off talking, he said, this is all about the mercies of God. This was a call for them all to live righteously. He wanted them to live a righteous life, is what he was pointing out to them. And to live that righteous life because God had done so much for them. That's how he saw it. By the mercies of God, I want you to live your life. I want you to live a righteous life because God has done so much for you. He wanted them to remember what God had already done in their lives. Not what he was going to do, but what God had already done in their life. And for that reason, they needed to live a righteous life. So who in here today, raise your hand today if you're blessed, if you think you're a blessed person. I hope everybody raise their hand that we are blessed here today. We are a blessed people. Who could say that God has been good to them? God has been good to me. I know he's been good to me. Paul was saying that that right there, that should be motivation enough for us to live our lives for Jesus. That alone, just saying, I'm blessed. God has done so much for me. That should be my motivation to just live a righteous life for Jesus. That no other motivation should be needed to live that life for Jesus. That just for what God has done for us, we should want to live a life that honors the Lord Jesus Christ, honors his great love, his grace, his mercies, his blessings that he's had for us in our lives. That should be, we shouldn't need anything else. We shouldn't need nothing else, but just that alone should make us just want to do something for God. Is that reasonable today? Do we think that? I think that's pretty reasonable today. Let's just say that if, if I went out, if I bought you a house, I bought you a car, each and every day I got up and made breakfast, lunch, and dinner for you, I took care of all your needs. And even Adrian went, woo, all of your needs, all your wants. If I took care of all this stuff for you, and you had nothing to worry about it, wouldn't it be reasonable that you would at least be good to me? That you at least treat me good? That you at least say, hey, Brother Thomas, when we walk by, you would think that'd be reasonable, right? If I did that much for you, you would think that'd be reasonable. With all that Jesus had done for us, is it not reasonable that we live in a way that would make him proud of us? If he's done all this great, wouldn't it be reasonable just to do something make him proud of us? Something that would make him happy. Something that would please him just for all the blessings. Because you all raise your hands. I don't think I saw anybody that didn't raise their hands saying they'd be blessed. That is what Paul was saying here. That's what he was saying in the verses. He said, you know what? I started off Romans. I told you about the gospel. I told you everything about the gospel. I laid it out for you. Tried to get that understanding for you. You know that Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb. He rose on the third day. And now he's given us that path to salvation. Now you can go through death, burial, and resurrection. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, you know the gospel. The gospel has been told to you. You know that you're once a sinner on your way to death, hell, and the grave. But Jesus came through. Jesus changed you. He made you different. You're a different person. Now that you know that, he got to the point in this chapter 12, said, now since you know all that, now that you've received the revelation of who Jesus is, now that you have the Holy Ghost, it is time to start living a life that's pleasing to Jesus for all that he's done for you. He's like, is that not reasonable? Don't you think that's reasonable for us to do? Now with that said, going back to if I did all those great things for you, you never had to work ever again. You, you had everything you wanted, you, even things that you needed, then I might think you want to do more than just what's reasonable, right? If I was that good to you, you probably wouldn't do what, more than just saying, good job. Hey, Thomas, how are you today? You know, you may want to do some a little bit more. If I did that much, wouldn't, wouldn't you think so? Hey, Thomas, won't you come? I'll buy you dinner tonight. Hey, Thomas, I got a present for you because you've been so good to me. You know, you would think somebody done that good for you, you'd want to do something good for them. Not just thank you or pat on the back, you would think that you'd want to do more. Do something so much more for somebody that's done something so great for you. I would think it'd be reasonable to even do a little bit more. So what do we consider reasonable today? What is reasonable? What do you think is reasonable for what Jesus has done for you? What do you consider reasonable? 
Is it reasonable to be at church every chance that you can get? Sometimes we can't, but wouldn't it be reasonable to be here every chance that we could? Is it reasonable to come into this church and give a little bit of praise and worship? Is that reasonable today? Say, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to enter in the courts with thanksgiving in my heart. They sung it a lot better than me, but enter into his courts with praise. When Sing along with the songs. Clap your hands. Isn't that raise your hands and praise and worship? Wouldn't that be reasonable? How much do we value what Jesus has done for us? Enough to give him our all? Is what the Lord has done for us enough to make us not just Sunday Christians, but to be a Christian Monday through Saturday also? Is what he's done for us, is it reasonable enough to say what he's done for us? Maybe I should pray at home too and not just at church. Maybe I should pick up my Bible at home and read it also. Maybe, you know, I should do that dreadful fasting thing every once in a while. How much do we value what God has done for us? We put value on what, mm, we put value on stuff in this world. What do we value what God has done for us? What has, what, how do we put that in reasonable? From the value that we, what he's done for us, how valuable is that to make it reasonable service? Just your reasonable service. And that is the question we must all ask ourselves. I cannot answer it for you. You can't answer it for me. But we must all look at our lives and see what it means for us. How much do I value what God has done for me to call that my reasonable service? The devotional book made this statement. It said, a full understanding of the gospel message of Jesus Christ will always drive us to more sacrifice and more holiness, not less. When I read that, that, that really hit some with me. We started this whole series talking about the gospel. Paul wanted everybody to fully grasp and understand the gospel. What it took for us to have this great salvation, the plan, the path. We're getting close to Christmas. That was a part of the start of the plan. He was born on this earth. We're building. He was building up that plan. It was all a plan. The path, the path that Jesus walked, the death, the road, the Calvary, the cross, the thorns, the beatings, everything that he took. He wanted us to remember that. If you know the gospel, if you truly know what it took for us to get to this point, to get what we have, to get that full understanding, then he'll want us, we'll want to sacrifice just like me doing something great for you. If I'd done all that great stuff for you, you'd want to do something good for me. Jesus did all this for us. He went to the cross. He, did, he sacrificed himself. So then that should make us want to sacrifice ourselves, to give of our own selves, to give of our own time, our own wants, our own desires, to say, I want to do something that would please God. I want to do something that would make him proud of me for what he has done for me, to get closer to him. We will also want to be holy as our Lord God is holy because we want to be more like Him. We'll want to live a life of holiness if we truly understand the gospel message, what it took for us to be here. The gospel message is so powerful. It is a powerful message. Paul also wanted to remind readers that anything, anything that he would ask of us in the very grand scheme of it, is so, so, so small compared to the great and wonderful work he has done for us. There's nothing he could ask us to do that could even compare to the work that he's already done for us, that he's already accomplished in our lives. Anything I can give to Jesus for what he's done for me will never come close for what he has done. I can never repay. We can never outgive God. No matter how hard we try, we can never outgive God. I believe it was Brother Bobby Belcher that would always say, if I had to serve the Lord for the rest of my life, standing on my head, I'd get by cheap. Because he's been so good to us. God has given us so much grace, so much mercy in our lives. And that grace and mercy, it has changed our lives. We're different now than we were before. We are a changed people. And that grace and that mercy still to this day keeps changing our lives, keeps making us into different people. We can see that. Romans 12 and 1, like we read Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, like we've been talking about. So next we see that Paul, he goes on to talk about that we need to present our bodies. 
The word translated here in Greek as present means this. It means to yield, to surrender, submit, give away, give up, or relinquish possession. Paul is saying that each one of us needs to offer ourselves to God as that living sacrifice. We need to submit ourselves, surrender our will, surrender our ways, surrender how we want to do it to His will in His way. Present our bodies as that living sacrifice. Because he used the word sacrifice because he was the Jews knew what he was talking about. They, were all, they knew about sacrifice. Even the heathen knew about sacrifice of that time. They used, to, they used to have to go, well, they still at that time, they'd still go to the temple. They'd bring a sacrifice, a cow, a goat, a ram, a lamb to the temple. And it had to be perfect. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. No spot, no blemish, no wrinkle. It had to be perfect. Not even a slight flaw could be in that sacrifice for it to be what you use. And you couldn't bring just any leftover. You couldn't just go to your field and say, well, I don't like the look of that one. I'll grab that one. You couldn't do that. It couldn't be the runt. It couldn't be the worst looking. It couldn't be just whatever was left over when you got done doing what you wanted to do. It had to be the best without fault, without, without spot, without wrinkle. And I'm not going to go into it. We'll leave that for another time. But we do need to look at what we give Jesus today. We do need to look at what we give Jesus today. Are we giving him the best that we have or just the leftovers at the end? I'm done with what I want to do. I'll give something to you. We need to all look. That's another thing. We need to look in the mirror sometimes and judge ourselves. We can't judge each other on that, but we need to judge ourselves. What are we giving Jesus? We'll leave that. We'll let the pastor preach that sometime. So anyways, they laid the sacrifice on the altar. They brought their sacrifice. They laid it on the altar. It was killed, blood sprinkled, all the different things that was going on. And then just like the pastor done, bang, sin covered up right there, gone away, covered up for a season. But now Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. So now it was time for a new sacrifice. Jesus was setting forth a new sacrifice. And that's us. We're called to be that living sacrifice. Because Jesus gave of himself. He gave his body for us as a sacrifice, for our salvation. So we can be saved today. So our response should be that we should offer our lives to him as sacrificial worship. Just our lives. Live a life for him out of worship. It's worship to God when we do that stuff. He doesn't need a bunch of people that die for him. He needs people to live for him. He died for us so we can live for him to be that living sacrifice, to live that life that he would have us live, live a life that shows Jesus to the world. So when they look at us, they see him, they see him through us. We got to be his hands. We got to be his feet of Jesus. First Corinthians 6 and 19. Paul says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have a God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And just one thing, I didn't have my notes, but one thing to point out here, God, if we remember, God created everything. He spoke into existence. There's only one thing God bought, and he paid for it. And he paid for it mm, with his own blood, and that is the church. There's one thing if some's given to you, but if you had to work hard for it, you appreciate a little bit more. God worked hard for us. He gave something for us. He, we're the only thing that Jesus ever bought, and he bought it with his own blood. So it should be a reasonable service to just raise those hands and say, thank you, Jesus. You shed your blood. You bought me. It's very reasonable for me to give you a little bit of praise, a little bit of worship, and to give you a little bit of me, to give you a little bit of me, because you have gave all of you I can give a little bit of me today. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you for buying us today, Lord. Bought with a price. So we're called to serve God in our bodies as well as in our spirit. Mm. We got to serve him in our bodies. We got to serve him in our spirit. The, so that people see who we belong to. Because we, 
we, we belong to somebody so great today. We belong to such a great God. And they need to see Him through us. They should see Jesus through us. Our bodies will become that instrument that God uses to show His glory to the world. He uses us just like we use instruments to play and sing, do songs and stuff. He uses us. Our bodies is that instrument to show Himself to the world, to show His glory to those of the world. He came and showed us that it is possible to live a holy life, to live a way that pleases Him. Now that very same Spirit that dwelled inside of Jesus can be inside of us. And then now we can be Jesus to the world. We can show Him to the world. We can show His glory to the world. Those sacrifices we talked about, they were pinned up. They took them. They pinned them up. They separated them from other animals to keep them apart from everything else so they would be kept they would, be, they would not get the spot, the blemishes on them. They stuck them away, put them by themselves, separated from all this stuff. Now, us as believers, we can't just be fenced away from the world, a physical fence put up to keep us away from the things of the world. We got to be in the world. We are in the world, but we got to be separated from the world, separated from worldliness, but we are called to live our lives separate from the world, different from the world, not letting the things of this world come in and blemish us, to change us, to mold us. We'll talk about it more later, to influence us, to change the way that we are. We got to live in this world. We can't be fenced off like them, but just like that sacrifice, we got to be without spot. We got to be without blemish. We got to keep ourselves away from the things of the world. Romans 1 and 1, Paul starts off Romans by telling us, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He walked, he went and preached the message wherever he, he had to be in the world. He was around the worldliness, but he said, I'm separated unto the gospel of God. I'm different, a separated person. Paul lived in a way that separated himself. Now we are called to be set apart for God, to be his chosen people. We've read it before in 1 Peter 2 and 9. We're called to be that chosen generation, that royal priesthood, that holy nation, that peculiar people. And why? So it will show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we'll, so people will see us. They'll see Jesus through us say, you know what? I want out of that darkness. I want into that marvelous light. Because we have been chosen. We've been bought. We are set apart from the things of this world. And, that holy, and be that holy nation for God, that peculiar people, ones that remember what God has done for us and to give back those praises to Him for all that He's done for us, that reasonable service just to give back for what He's done for us. Then there'll be that ah, sweet aroma to God. He'll smell those praises that, oh, they're set apart. Mm, that, that smells good to me, that separated person. We, this is scriptural, Leviticus. It's in there a bunch, but I'll pull one out of Leviticus. It says, In his inwards and his legs, they'll wash him with water. The priest shall burn it all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire. That sweet savor, that sweet aroma going up to God. And you think, oh, how can that be sweet? The burning of all that flesh, that can't be very sweet, but it smelled good to him. Why? Because it showed his people had a desire to get in the right relationship with him. They desired <clears throat> to get close to him, so they brought the sacrifice. They set it aside months ahead of time, made sure, checked it every day, made sure it didn't have spot, spot and blemish because they desired. When our lives are positioned to be pleasing to God, then our lives will have that sweet aroma. We'll smell good. We'll smell good to Jesus. We'll be that. We'll, we'll want to get in that right relationship with him. We'll want him the smell us and us be smelling good. So now let's look at what Paul defined as a separated life. Romans 2 and 12. And, or Romans 12 and 2. Sorry, JV. <laughs> and be not conformed to this world, but be the transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anoint your head with oil. That you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He told his readers to not be conformed to this world. Do your reasonable service and don't be conformed to this world. The word, trans, the word translated as conformed means this, to be fashioned after or patterned after. 
And then the word for world refers to this, customs or patterns of the worldly society we find ourselves living in. So what Paul is trying to tell us here is not pattern our lives. Don't conform. Don't pattern our lives like the world, like society, like the way the world would, like Hollywood would show us. The fads and fashions of this world, that the culture we live in should not be what should be telling us how to live, how to act, what to do that we need to be living according to what thus says the Word of God. Be guided by the Word of God, not by politicians, not by actors, businessmen, leaders of the nation. It shouldn't matter. We should not conform to their patterns. We should be conforming to the Word of God. What thus says the Bible, what thus says the Word of God, the way we act, the way we dress, the way we treat others, the way that we walk in this world, the way that we show ourselves to others should be influenced by the Bible. It should show that we are that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It should be Jesus's influence and not the world's influence in our lives that we show. And why? Why do we say that? It's because we can't have both. You can't do both. The world has been marked by sin. And because of that, it is guided in a very carnal way, in a sinful way. And that, and that makes it at war with the ways of God. The ways of God and the ways of the world are battling against each other. They don't mix. Oil and water, it doesn't mix together. Romans 8 and 7 says, Because the carnal mind, this worldly mind, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. James 4 and 4, he says, Ye adulterers and uh, adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? You can't have both. Well, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. We can't have both. We can't conform to the ways of the world and think that we can have the ways of God at the same time. They war against each other. They're fighting against each other. They don't like each other. They are enemies. They're the worst of enemies. Always battling. So you do have to pick a side. We can't be Switzerland. Can't stand on the fence. Got to pick a side today. It's either God's ways or is it the ways of the world? Just look at the news. It will show you that just like in Paul's days with Rome, Rome was the center capital of it all. It's where all this, all this junk that we even see in our world today was during that time of Rome also. They let it all go on. Paul said, I know what happens. Sin, sin has this world and that's all the world has to give. We need the ways of God instead. Don't be conformed to the worldly influences, but instead be transferred by the renewing of your mind. The Greek word that was translated in the transform is the same word that metamorphosis came from. So let's go back to elementary school for a minute. When I was in elementary school, which was a long, long time ago, <laughs> they, they taught us metamorphosis by caterpillar. Caterpillar, caterpillar, if I can get the word out here. Seeing, we see how it starts off. It was not very pretty when it started off, just a bug. Some of the girls probably screamed and seeing the bug. But now that caterpillar, it goes through a transformation that makes it into a beautiful butterfly. It was an external change, a crawling bug into a flying, colorful butterfly, something that looked good. When we renew our minds, it does more than just transform us on the inside. As it does that, it, transfers, it transforms our thoughts, our ways, our th everything but it also produces an external transformation as well. When we get our minds renewed to the power of the Holy Ghost, our lives start to transform. And day by day, we become more Christ-like. We decide to become more like Christ in the way that we talk, in the way that we act, in the way that we dress, in the way that we treat the world. Those frowns start turning into smiles. We start getting, we, it transforms from the inside and out. It makes us a different person. We need, and we start to strive to become more like Christ. Colossians uh, 3 and 2 tells us, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. The world is always out to change how we think. It wants to transform our minds. It wants to change us into something else. It wants to influence our thinking on what is right versus wrong. It wants us to question, well, is that really wrong? I mean, that was a long time ago in the Bible. Is that does it really matter that much? Because ungodliness surrounds us daily, and it is seeking to change us. 
It's seeking us to change us into something else. That is why we're called to transform our minds and set our thoughts on things above, on the things of God, to protect our minds from that influence. Like the pastor preached the message, anoint our heads with oil, to protect this mind. That we got to transform it. It needs to be protected. It needs to be anointed with that oil. Keep our minds protected. Because if we don't, we'll become desensitized to the world's perspective. And we'll not, we won't think it is bad is what it really is. Well, it's not that bad. We'll start desensitizing ourselves to the things that God says is not right. If we don't, if we don't transform this mind. That's why we all like, that's why we always like to say what, Pastor? We need the Holy Ghost. Need the Holy Ghost. We need it every day working in our lives to help us live that holy life that's acceptable unto God. So 1 Corinthians 3 and 9, it said, For we are laborers together with God, and you are God's husbandry and are God's building. Paul was trying at this point, he wanted to get readers to get their mind on building something, to construct something and to know that we are constructing our own lives. That each day we're constructing our own lives. It shows throughout the whole uh, chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. And Paul lays it out for us as we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. I won't read it since I'm running out of time here. But, but I just want to tell a story here. It's an offset of story that, we should all, that should help us lay out the point of what Brother Paul is trying to tell us here. There was these three little pigs. And these three little pigs, they needed a home. They needed a place to live. Their parents kicked them out, broke their plate, said, hey, it's time. You got to get, get out of here. You got to get out of here. You got to find a place of your own. Set up a place for you to live. But to help them out, because their parents knew a thing or two, they laid a foundation for each pig. They went out and laid them all a foundation for them to build their house on. It was a strong foundation, a sure foundation, one that would never break down. It was Great foundation. So now with the foundation poured, each little pig could build upon it. They could build their own house upon that foundation. Now the building materials, they could vary. But they were told, don't worry about, but they were told, don't forget about your enemy. As you're building on this foundation, I give you, don't forget about your enemy, the big bad wolf. Said, you know what, that big bad wolf, it likes to play with matches. So just look out for him. So build your house with wisdom. Think about the materials and if they will endure when that enemy comes. Will, will they burn up or will they last? Choose quality, little piggies. Choose quality today. So the first pig, he went out and he decided, I want to go cheap. I want to go quick. I want to install. I, want to, I got a good foundation. I'm going to throw something on there so I can get back doing what I want to do. I want to get back to my ways, the stuff I want to do. He said the foundation's good, so it doesn't matter what I put on there. It'll stand. So he grabbed some hay, went home, and got to work, and he built that house. The second pig said, well, hay and straw, they are cheap, but, you know, it is a good foundation, so I'll build something a little bit better. It, may, it might look all, I'm going to do a pretty beautiful log house. That's what I'm going to do. It won't be quick and lazy like my brother. He's just lazy, but it'll be beautiful, made out of wood. I know it isn't the best like those precious stones, gold and silver, but that's okay. So loaded up his wood, he went home, he built his house. But then that third little piggy came. He stopped in the store and he said, hmm, the fat, that's the best foundation that was ever laid. They laid us the, I mean, that found nothing will ever happen to that. There's none better. It's sure, it's strong, nothing compares. No storm can knock that foundation down. I've been given something great, so I better take care to build up a great house upon it. One that will stand the very test of time. So he got some gold. He got some silver. He got some precious stones. He spent a while building the house. It wasn't quick to build. It took him a while, making sure it was done correctly. Anything that didn't seem right, if it didn't seem perfect, had spot, had wrinkle, had something inside, he pitched it to the side. He wanted it to stand, and he wanted it to reflect the greatness of the foundation. So he put his time, and he put his effort into it. <clears throat> and then, as we all know, one day the enemy came along. The big, bad, paramaniac wolf. He loved to play with matches. Pyromaniac, sorry, I said the word wrong. Pyromaniac. He came by the first little pig's house and spoke, little pig, little pig, let me in. The pig said, what did the pig say? Oh, the hair on my chinny chin chin. Yeah, y'all know the story. So the wolf said, okay, 
then I'll burn your house down. So he, strike, strike, strike that match. And he threw it on the hay. And of course, as we know, the hay went up in flames. So a little pig ran to his brother's house made out of wood. The big bad wolf comes to that house made of wood. And he said, little pig, little pig, let me in. Chinny, chin, chin. There we go. So the wolf, strike, strike, strike that match. Set the wood house on fire. It was a beautiful house. He made it look good. But it still was made out of wood, so it caught on fire. So now they both ran with the flames on their behinds to run to their third brother's house. His house, though, was made of gold, made of silver, made of precious stones. So the big bad wolf came along and said, little pig, little pig, let me in. My chinny chin chin. So all the pigs responded to that. So the wood, so the wolf strike, strike, strike that match through it. Nothing happened. It didn't burn. He tried again. It would not burn. None of the house's foundations fell that day, were destroyed, but, the, but just the house that they built. The foundations of them all were sure they were all strong, but they had a choice on how they were going to build on that foundation. The only one that chose wisely and made sure it would stand the test of time, only one did, and that was that third little pig. The foundation of ours today is Jesus Christ, and it's the foundation that will never come down. The house we build upon it may get knocked down, but like those pigs, that foundation, it stood. Paul said that it's, there's no greater foundation. And when we set our lives on Jesus Christ, we get filled with the Holy Ghost. We walk in His ways. We get laid that great foundation, just like those pigs did. It is sure. It is strong. But it's up to us on what materials we're going to build our house upon that great foundation. 1 Corinthians 3 and 12. If any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. We, there's all different types of materials today, church. Some will stand the test of time and some won't. But it's up to us to decide what we're going to build on that sure foundation. The materials that we use, it doesn't represent our talents or gifts God has given us. But they do represent what we do with what God has given us. What we do with those great things God has given us. Are we using what God gives us to show His glory, to build up a beautiful house, to show the glory of God, to show Jesus to the world, to, to be one that shows the grace, love, and mercy or and holiness of God? Or are we wasting it, slapping together some quick with cheap materials just to get by? Because there is a day coming that we will be tested on how we built our house, on how we spend our time. That day will come. Do we want what was pleasing to God or do we want just enough to get by? Because we're all tested. Paul told us this in 1 Corinthians 3 and 13. Every man's work shall be manifest, shall be tested. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And that fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. One day, just like those little piggies, fire will reveal exactly what we have done. It can make us look pretty. We can make ourselves look as pretty as we can. Fix it all up. Fix up the outside. Make us look like we know what we're doing. Look the part. Look really good, just like that log cabin. But when the fire comes, will it prove that we're just hiding something? Will it reveal our hidden secrets? Or will it show us what we really, or will it show that we really are close to God? To make us look good underneath, or that we really are what we say are? The fire will reveal it. 1 Corinthians 3 and 14, it said, If any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I, I want to read this again in New Living Translation, just to point out something here that I liked about this. It said, if the work survives, that the builder shall receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder shall be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. The first pig and the second pig, they made it out of the fire, but they barely escaped with their lives. Their feet, they were feeling the flames on their feet from their behinds as they were running out the door. They didn't get no reward. All they had was a thing of ash in the end. So I'm here to tell you today that it is important of, what, of how you build this life. I'm here to tell you what you build with is important. Yes, the little pig with hay and wood survived. They made it through the skin of their teeth, but there was no reward. The third pig, 
He didn't have to feel those flames chasing him from behind. He didn't have to run for his life. He got rewarded for his work. So yes, we may make it out. You may make it out to not doing anything that you want. Maybe. But I would want to make sure that I knew for sure. I want to live a life that shows that I'm not just surviving, but that I'm thriving. And that's how we should live our life. Build it up sure. Build it up strong. So no matter what comes, we know that we'll make it through. That we won't just show the rest of the world. What are we showing the world when it all comes crumbled down? Did we really show them the greatness of God when our house got knocked down? When it got burned up? Because if, we, if it gets burnt up, they're looking at, well, what did serving God do for you, Sister Judy? You must have been no good. Look at the mess around you. But when they see how sure it stands upon that sure foundation, that even when the storms came and things was rocking, things were shaking, that in the end, you're still standing, you're still strong, still looking good. It shows that God is in control. It shows the greatness of the God that we serve. And I'm completely out of time. Uh, let me just jump ahead. I just want to point out this. It was something I read in the devotional book. This man had passed by and he saw three workers working a ditch. And he said, what are you guys doing? The first one said, we're digging a ditch. The second guy said, we're digging a ditch for a water line of a soon to be building. But the third man said, we're building a cathedral. And when we're done, oh, it's going to be the most beautiful church in this whole city. So what are we building today, church? Jesus is their foundation. We have that great foundation. What are we building? What are we contributing? Are we just saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just digging a ditch today, huh? I'm just digging. Are you saying, I'm, I'm serving the king of kings. I'm, looking for, I'm, I'm building the kingdom of God. I'm seeing streets laid with gold. I, I'm seeing a place where I get to spend eternity with Jesus forever. What are we telling people? Are we telling them, oh, the preaching's good at my church, the singing's good? Are we saying, Jesus is good? Let, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the great one that I serve. So I'm going to close here today and finish it off with these last scriptures, scriptures, JB, Mark 3 and 32. And the multitude set about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about them, which said about him and said, Behold, my mother, my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. The family of God is all of us. All of those men, women, and children who just do the will of God who decide to do their reasonable service, who stand upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, who decides to build that on that strong foundation. We have a great big family today, church. We have all of us to help, help us to lean on each other, to be a blessing and a help for each other. So we need each other in this life. I just want to point it out. We need each other. We're family. We're brothers. We're sisters, mothers. We need each other. And we need Jesus. We need that transformation of our mind. We need to renew that mind. And it'll help us live that life that's pleasing to God. And when those times get rough, we can lean on our brother, our sister, to help us in those struggling times. So to, I want to end this whole series with just this. If you haven't experienced the gospel, the power of the gospel message, then there's no better time than today. All it takes is repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus. And then we were able to receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. So make sure you live that life that's pleasing to God. Build your life with strong materials. So when the storms come, when the shaking comes, the materials don't fail. But everybody will see that you're a child of God. God bless.
deep down I know this world is a home. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come. Hallelujah. Just give the Lord a clap yes, off and a praise this morning. Lord, we thank you. We think about that scripture that I had read earlier at the beginning of the service that he would draw nigh unto us. And even though there are times when we are waiting and we're wanting the Lord to come back, he can draw nigh to us if we will call out to him. And it will not be as good as the day as when he's going to come, Brother Jerry, but it will be a day when he will be there with us to bring us the peace and the joy and the, and the rest and the comfort or whatever it is that we might need this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn to chapter, uh, the book of Acts chapter 12, 1 through 11. Got a little bit of a longer read than I normally do this morning, but it helps tell the story that we're going to be getting into. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. It says, Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. So he was pinpointing certain people of the church that he was going after. He, 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 had a, he had a hit list, if you want to say. He was wanting to grab a hold of a couple of people, and he wanted to vex them. And the Bible says that he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaturians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So he was going to have to keep him for a certain period of time. So he had to have him in jail. He had to guard him and make sure that he didn't escape or somebody didn't try to break him out because he knew he was going to have to keep him for a period of time until Easter. And then he was going to bring him forth to the people, no doubt with the same intent that he was going to do with James, and that was to kill him. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. He was held prisoner, but prayer. Yes. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God on his behalf for him. He was kept in the prison, but this time while he was being kept prisoner, as he was being held, the church was about its business. The church was praying without ceasing unto God on his behalf. And when, Jer and when Herod would have brought him forth, the exact same night, that it, the night before he was to come forth for the people, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers, behold, the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison and smote Peter on the side and, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garments about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he had saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know. Now I know. I know, sure. He didn't know exactly how. He didn't know what was going on in the background, what was going on behind the scenes. But I know a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel. He has dispatched his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. This morning, I want to just speak on this thought just for a moment. Prayer breaks the chains. Prayer is what it takes to break the chains, Brother Jerry. Prayer, it's going to take a prayer, not just an individual prayer, but it's going to take a corporate prayer. It's going to take a church that is praying together, that is unified for one single purpose, praying unceasingly to be able to break the chains of bondage in somebody's life. Brother John, if you would, please pray. God, we thank you today for your mercy. God, we thank you for your mercy, your grace, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. I I worship you, Lord. I glorify you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done, Lord. God, I ask you that you would anoint this message, anoint my mind, anoint my soul. God, let this word be from you and not from me. God, let it be from your heart and not my heart. Let it be from your mind, Lord Jesus, God. We just ask you, Lord, to move on this congregation, God, to give us a revelation, God, about prayer this morning, the revelation of the seriousness and the power 
power that lies within prayer, God. And we'll give you praise, and we'll always give you the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, give him one more clap off and the praise. Shake a couple of hands. Tell everybody, I'm going to pray for you this week. And mean it. When you, do, when you shake hands with them, mark their face and remember that you're going to pray for them this week, Lord Jesus. <sighs> Prayer breaks the chains. In our scriptures here, Herod Agrippa I has found a way to please the Jews. He is the nephew of, of Herod that had beheaded John the Baptist, so he's no stranger to the idea of a religious persecution. And he decides that he's going to go after certain individuals of the church. It said that he had planned on, he planned on vexing certain uh, of the church. He had, he had a hit list. Again, as I said, he had a, a group of people that he wanted to, to get, and James just happened to be one of them. And when he captured James, uh, he took him and he beheaded him. He decides to go after those. And this is about 10 years past the day of Pentecost, and the church has been growing and the church has become established. Uh, Peter has been to Cornelius's house. Salvation has come to the Gentiles. The church is spreading. It's growing due to the persecution that's being brought to the Jews. God has recruited Saul uh, for the gospel. And instead of persecuting the church, he is helping to spread this gospel. The enemy had thought that what we can do is we can persecute the church and we can take them and arrest them and put them in jail, even killing some of them, and we'll slow the spread of this virus. We can stop this virus, this Christianity that is beginning to spread, and it's taking some of our members and some of these Jews. But what the enemy thought to do for harm, it ended up doing good for the church because what it did, as the persecution began to come, the people began to spread and to, to, to run away from the persecution. But what they did, was they took the gospel with them. Everywhere that they were going, they were taking the gospel with them, and it was beginning to spread the gospel. It was beginning to spread the church, and the church was beginning to grow everywhere. He thought that he could lay a heavy hand on the church, but when you put a heavy hand on the church, the church ought to come alive. When, when the enemy comes in like the flood, God will raise up a standard amongst us when it feels like the enemy, but it's the church that has to do the business. It's the church that has to get about the business of spreading the gospel. It forces the spread, and they had struggled. The, the, the apostles had struggled understanding that the Gentiles were going to receive the gospel. But now, according to Acts 28 and 4, it was going to the barbarians. They were, Paul, was, Paul, was, Paul was out on, a, on an island, for a bunch of barbarians, a bunch of wild people, and the gospel ended up being spread there. They were, they were on the path to becoming the witnesses of Jesus to the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel it was just like Brenda talking about everything is going on there in Africa. Listen, if the if, if the people of America, if we're we're not gonna get we're not gonna pay attention. If it feels like America's falling away from God, God is gonna take a number. He's gonna have reach a number. And if he's got to go to foreign nations and he's got to save thousands of people, if we're not gonna get thousands of people here, if we're not gonna reach out to thousands, somebody will. Somebody's gonna do the work of the kingdom. Herod captures James and he beheads him, and James is one of the leaders of the church. And this no doubt shakes the church to its core. It has to. How in the world is God going to allow one of our leaders to be captured and to be headed? I, I, I can't fathom the things because I've not been in their shoes. I, I can't fathom the things that might be going through their minds. We've lost people. We've lost leaders in the church. And I know, uh, you know, I, and we've lost loved ones at an early age. And I've wondered and I scratch my head and I don't understand it. And I can't imagine what the church is feeling here. But they know that something is going on. And the enemy is coming after our leaders. And they're trying to find ways in which we, again, they can slow that spread. He's changed his tactics and Instead of just bringing persecution, we'll cut the head off. If we'll cut the head off, if we can take care of the head, then the, then the body won't have any help. They won't have that, that, that mind, that, that thing that directs and leads them gone. But they forgot that it's Jesus is the one that's the head. They can't cut off the head because the head is Jesus Christ. The head is God. They can't take off the head. Herod sees that this sees that this pleases the leaders of the Jews, so he decides, I'm going to capture one other leader. I'm, I'm going to go after the man that started all this mess in Acts chapter 2. I'm going after Peter. He's the one that preached that first message. 
We're going to grab him, and when I bring him before the people and we take care of him, man, you talk about dancing and joys. They're going to dance in the streets when we bring Peter up before him. He takes Peter and he places him in the prison, and it's not quite time yet. Uh, he wanted to wait until after a certain time before he brings him up, and so he puts him in the prison, and he charges him to be locked up with 16 soldiers, 16 trained soldiers to keep one fisherman locked up in a jail. <laughs> He's in a jail. He is in a prison. He has bars and he has walls around the bars. The door is locked. There's a key that takes the open the door and Peter don't have the key. And he places men inside the, in that cell with him and chains him to him. And he's got 16 men that are responsible. And there's keepers outside the door to make sure the door, nobody gets inside. For one guy. <laughs> For one fisherman. For one man of God. <laughs> For one man of God. That's how much Herod was afraid of just one man of God. One man that was anointed, that was full of the Holy Ghost. They had evidently had heard something. If you remember in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the others had began to stir up people and they were preaching in the synagogues and, and the Bible said that they had arrested them and placed them in the common prison in Acts chapter 5 verse 18. But they somehow... Escaped. Acts chapter 5, 19 through 20 says, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple of the people all the words of this life. And that's exactly what they did. And when the, uh, the, the, the priest came the next day to collect them, they weren't there. And the, the, the guards were sitting there. We don't know what happened. These guys were here. And then all of a sudden we turned around and they're, they're not there. They're just simply gone. They couldn't even keep them one whole night. They couldn't keep them one whole night. They couldn't keep them in prison for one night. And I'm sure that Herod had heard about this. He'd heard that how, how Peter had made his jailbreak and his prison break before. He said, that's not happening on my watch. That's not going to happen. We're going to put 16 men, and we're going to surround him with 16 men. We're going to put him in this jail, and there's going to be an inner, and there's an outer court, and this is a big prison system. And he's going down into the center there, and there's going to be 16 men, and there's going to be two people that's chained to him at, at least at all time, and we're going to make sure this boy is there. And they kept him. He was going to make sure that there was no physical way that Peter was going to be able to escape from this prison that he was in. Acts chapter 4 and 5 says, Peter, therefore, he was kept. They kept him up until this time in the prison. But I love, I love, I love the word but. I love to read the word but in the Bible. I love it because there's always a negative, but then there's a positive. But Peter was in prison. He was locked up. He was kept more than just one night. He had soldiers chained to him. He had walls and he had bars and there was keys that he didn't have access to. And they were chained up and they were watching him and keepers amongst the door. But the church, but the church had gone, gotten in together. The church has decided we're going to bind together and we're going to begin to make, we're going to make prayer. We're not just going to pray. We're going to make it. We're going to manufacture. We're going to make some prayer and we're going to do it without ceasing of the church unto the God. We're going to pray to God that God somehow makes a move in this situation for Peter. He was a prisoner, but <laughs> he was a prisoner, but he was in jail, but he was in jail. He was, he was depressed. He was upset. He was worried. He was scared. But the church, the church made prayer. The church got together and began to pray without ceasing. He might have been sick. He might have all oh, no telling what was going through Peter's mind at this time. My brother James has just been beheaded. But the church began to make prayer for him without ceasing. How am I going to get out of this? The angel came on the first night. Where's the angel this time? I'm having to be kept in this prison for multiple days. Pete James has just lost his head. What's going to happen? But, but from the moment that the church hears about Peter begin captured, they get busy and they get praying and they decide we're not stopping until something happens. We're not going to stop until we're going to bind together as a corporate group. We're going to bind together as a church and we're going to begin to pray and we're not going to stop praying until we hear something has happened, until we get that button, until we hear that positive effect. 
At some point before he had been headed, James had written in James chapter 1, he had penned some words of encouragement and direction to the church that had been scattered. This man that had just been beheaded, he had been penned some words to the church that had been scattered. And he told them what could be accomplished by a person that had been properly motivated to pray. James 5 and 6 says that the effectual, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails a whole lot. The fervent, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man has a lot of power. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man accomplishes a whole lot of things. And if you multiply that, if you say the fervent, effectual prayer of many righteous people, it's going to do exponential amount of work. The fervent. Prayers that had been prayed effectually, that had been prayed for a desire with a purpose. Prayers that were prayed fervently with an effort. Oh, now lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. Oh, uh, God is great. God is good. Let us thank you for his food. By his hands we'll be friend. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's not a fervent, effectual prayer. Yeah, that's praying. Yes, that's praying. But when you got a purpose... When you got a reason, when there is a need that's out there, we need to be. We need to learn. We need to. We need to learn to pray, Jerry. We don't need just to know how. To, we need to know how to pray. We need to know what to pray. We need to know why to pray. We need a whole list of things. Of, wow, we're going to begin to tackle situations when they come up in our lives. I need to learn. Mm. The effectual. Fervent prayer, a prayer that's prayed with a specific goal in mind, that's prayed with some exertion. Oh, Lord, just Lord, just bless Penny. Oh, Lord, just bless Hannah. Oh, Lord. That's not what, when, when the situation comes, when we get the doctor's report and it's not good, oh, that, oh, Lord, just bless Penny. That's not good enough sometimes. Sometimes we've got to get down and travail, and we've got to pray fervently. We've got to pray with some fervence. We've got to pray for some effect. God, I'm expecting. God, I'm saying this prayer with an expected result. God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I can't see, but I know a God that is able. I know a God that is able to. I don't know how many days he was in there. I don't know how many days they had to pray, but the Bible said that it was unceasing. From the moment that they, from the moment he goes there, we're going to pray unceasing. We are not going to stop. We're always going to have somebody praying. Thomas, I want you to take this hour of the day. And Brother John, I want you this hour. Sister Sierra, I want you to take this hour. Sister Charlene, I want you to take this hour. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray that God somehow makes a move in this situation for Peter. Herod with his plans to kill him, had no idea that he had people that was praying to a God that was a God of the circumstances, that was a God that was able to do, continue to do miracles where they had death on their minds. He had the blood of James on his hand. For Peter, They, I don't know why. I don't know why God took James. I don't understand why he allowed to do that. Maybe they didn't have time to pray for James, but they had time to be able to pray for Peter, and they was taking advantage of it. Yeah. They want to say, we got a little space of grace here. Let's see if we can change this situation. Let's see if we can break him out of this prison. He's sleeping between two soldiers. He's bound with chains. There's keepers at the door, but the angel of the Lord comes in and shines a light about him, blinding the soldiers, blinding to the guards to what's going on. And the angel hits Peter on the side. And Peter's, all of a sudden, he's sleeping in this jail. He knows James has just been beheaded by this same man, Herod. He's got chains bound to him. He's bound there. He's so how or the other. He got all in between the two soldiers. And he just lays up yeah. inside of them and says, guys, I, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. I, I don't care. Y'all Y'all spend the night here watching me. I, I'm going to bed. Going to bed. Somehow or another, those prayers had gotten to him and had brought a peace of mind to him. Somehow or another, his mind was kept on the Lord. Somehow or another, he was able to find a peace and a rest in the middle of this situation. 
Isaiah, Isaiah 26 and 3, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts thee. His body may have been in prison, but his thoughts were not. His mind was not. He was not a prisoner to the fear. He was not a prisoner to the anxiety over this situation. He trusted God. Could it have been that those effectual, fervent prayers, God, we need you to touch Peter's mind, God. I don't know how you're going to do it. How are you going to get him out of this jail? God, but I know you can, but, but up until then, God, bring him a peace, God, bring him some rest, God, bring him some comfort, Lord, consistently, all day, every day, the church was praying unceasingly for him, unceasingly, and the, pe- and the angel, wake up, boy, what, what, I was resting, leave me alone, I'm having a good nap here. Get up quickly. You need these. Cha- and as soon as he says that, the change falls off of his hands. Get yourself up. Put your sandals on. Get your garments together and follow me. Get out of this. And he does as the angel says. And it's like a dream to him. I could imagine it's like a dream. Man, where'd this guy come from? And all of a sudden, my change is just, he's half days coming out of sleep. What's going on? following you. Okay, okay, the chains are gone. What's these other guys? They're just sitting there dazed. They don't have no idea what's going on. These, these lousy soldiers are just sitting there. And, <laughs> Y'all ain't very good soldiers. Y'all ain't watching me all of a sudden. And he just gets up and he follows the angel with a little bit of obedience in him. With just a little bit of obedience in him. Whatever you say, God, wherever you will tell me to do, God, I'm going to just go ahead and do it. I'm going to trust, put my trust in you. And he follows me out and he goes through one part of the, the, the prison, goes through the another part of the and he, uh, prison, and he gets to the iron gate, and all of a sudden the gate just... He steps on that button there somewhere or another. It's like at the grocery store, the old Kroger's used to be. The doors just open up. And he goes through there one more street and the angel leaves and he comes to himself and he said, now I know. Now I know that God has, the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me. Now, now I have reached deliverance. Peter was in prison. He was in change. He was in a situation that the enemy was expecting that he would not be able to get out of. But the church was praying without ceasing to God on his behalf. And he found his release. God brought an angel to him in his time of trouble. God brought him an angel in his time of trouble while he was rested and brought just in the nick of time. Just in the very nick of time, God brought him an angel. And the next thing you know, now I know. But what he didn't know, what was going on in the background. What he didn't know, what was going on in the background. But he had a group of people that was praying for him. There are many prisons. There are many chains that people are captive by. Most prisons are not made with walls of concrete. Most prisons are not made of bars of steel. There are prisons that are spiritual. There are prisons that are mental. There are prisons that are emotional that people are bound up in. And I would say this morning, I I, I, I won't bet, but I know that there are people here today that are bound up in prisons today, that are chained up somehow. They, ha- they are bound in some kind of a prison, whether it's a, a prison of fear, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's stress, whether it's grief. It can be an addiction. It can be drugs. It can be alcohol. It could be the internet. It could be money. It could be the, the search for money. You could be addicted to the politics. You could be addicted to the news. You might be bound by the chains of lack of self-value. You may doubt that God loves you. You may doubt that God cares for you. You may have a place you doubt you have a place in the kingdom that God can do anything with you that God can you do anything for him that you can do anything through you you may feel like I can't be forgiven I've done gone too far I've done done too much but God can't forgive me you're broken you're messed up oh my God the whole world is full of broken and messed the church is full of broken and messed up people look in the look in the Bible it's full of broken and messed up people You may be in a prison of spiritual apathy where you just come and you set the bench and you're just like, I don't care. I'm just here because this is what I'm supposed to be. You're feeling like you just don't belong, that you don't, this ain't a place for you, but you just come because you're supposed to be here. You don't want to get involved in what's going on. You may be in prison in physical sickness. Your body may be sick. You may be a a prisoner to the pain. Whatever that prison is, you don't have to stay there today. 
Whatever those prisons are, whatever those chains are made up of, whatever those bars are made up of, no matter where that in prison might be, you don't have to stay there today. You don't have to stay there. You do not you do not have to remain locked up. God provides a way of escape and it's all centered around prayer. It's all centered around prayer and it's centered around it ain't like this little the church gets together and we just clap our hands and oh God we just want you to touch this one. Oh no. Oh no, it's not this all oh, no. It's a church that's down on their hands and is down on their knees and say God, I need you to move for my brother. God, I need you to move for my sister, Lord. I need you to move, God. I don't see a way of escape, God. I don't see how you can get them out of this trouble and anxiety. I don't know how you're going to deliver them from this grief, God. I don't know how you're going to bring peace into their life. But, God, I know you can. I don't know how, God, but I know you can. It's a church. It's through church that's praying, that's bound together for a single purpose. For a single purpose, we're going to get deliverance for sister, sister, or we're going to get a deliverance, deliverance for brother, brother, whoever it might be. Actively requesting God, commanding God in the works of his hands. Isaiah 45, 11, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of the things concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hand, command ye me. When I see a brother or sister that's bound, I can command God, God, you somehow have to bring deliverance to them. I have a power and I have the authority from being a child of God that I can command God. God tells me to do this. Command ye the works of my hand. Command my hands. God has told us to do this. And we are living so far below our privileges and the power and the authority that lies within the church. We just pray and we just, we pray without expecting. We pray without perseverance. We pray without, we pray without consistency. We pray, with, pray without fervency. And we just say, oh, God bless this one. And then we go on. We get to text message, pray for sister so-and-so. And we're doing our work, and we're praying for sister so-and-so. God love, bless her. Lord, Lord, touch the case, sister, whoever it might be. And we're all guilty of it. I do it. But when there is a situation, and it's okay, you can say your good night prayers or say your early in the morning prayers. But when there's somebody that's bound, when there's somebody that's bound up in a prison, I'm supposed to love my brother. I'm supposed to have a sacrifice, as Brother Thomas said. I'm supposed to be, a, my reasonable service is to find Sister Sarah bound up in something and I know about it. I'm supposed to bind together with the people of the church and say, God, I want you to deliver her. I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but that's your business. My business is the business of the church, and that's to pray. My business is the business of the church, and that's to pray. I do my work. She does her work. And then we let God do his work. Going back to James's word, we'll pick up some extra words he said. James 5, 13 through 16. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any married? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if any be, man, we come up here and get prayed for. Do you have the expectation? Do you have the scripture in your mind? I'm coming here asking for the elders of the, of the church to pray for me. I have an expectation because of the word of God and what the word of God says that I expect. I'm expecting God to work. I'm expecting God because that's God's business. As long as they do their job, I do my job. Then it's God's business to do his job. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Confess your faults to one another. Pray, pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth. It accomplishes. It has power. Come on. It has power. There are three, all kinds of types of prayer. He says there's a secret prayer. When you're afflicted, you got to pray yourself. There's ministerial prayers. When you're sick, you're supposed to call for the elders of the church. But then there's a social prayer where the church, you pray. When I see Thomas in trouble, I'm supposed to pray. It's my responsibility to pray for Thomas. It's your responsibility to pray for Thomas. When I know that he's bound up, when I see that he's got problems, whether it's family problems, drug problems, whatever it might be, it's my job to pray. It's your job. 
You don't leave it to the elders. You don't leave it to the pastor. It's ever, it is the church's responsibility, each and every one of us, as being a member of the church, of the body of Christ. It is our responsibility to effectually and fervently pray for one another. To have a prayer. I am praying for effect. I am praying until I see an answer. There are times you pray for yourself. There are times you pray for, that you pray, have the, 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 the elders pray for you. But there are times when you need to pray for others. There are times the church needs to pray together for a purpose. And it's not just sending a text, oh, prayers, okay, I'm responding to the text and prayer, but I get back to work and I never think about it again. I never think, well, what? no, you know what you should be doing? You should be praying, waiting a couple of hours and say, what are we hearing? What's going on? I'm expecting God to do something. I'm expecting God to, to release that prisoner. I'm expecting God to, to deliver them. I'm expecting God to heal. That's God. He's God. He, he's in the miracle working business. I can't do it. Only God can. What's, what, what's going on? I, I need to hear some news. Nothing makes me matter than when people get prayer requests and you don't ever hear anything back out of them. Nothing makes me matter than to hear, you need to pray for this, and I never hear one word. What I want to hear is, they still need prayer. We need to continue praying. Or I want to hear, actually what I want to hear is, God moved. <laughs> they needed prayer, but the church. They needed prayer, but the church. They needed prayer, but the church got involved. The people got in prayer, and they began to pray without ceasing. When we hear somebody that is bound up, whatever that prison must be, we have got to bind together in church, in prayer, and facilitate their release. And it takes us, and it takes them, and it takes God. But we are an integral part as a church, as a group, as a group. James didn't specify what the need was like he did for if you're afflicted, you pray, or if you're sick, you, get, you call for the ministerial team and have them pray. It simply says whatever, when it just says you need to pray. And so what that means is whenever the need arises, we pray. Whenever the need arises, we pray, but we pray effectually. We pray fervently. We pray unceasingly. And we pray like a righteous person. That's what we pray for. Praying without ceasing, determining in ourselves, I'm going to pray until I hear something. I am going to pray until I hear they've been released. I'm going to pray until I hear that we need to change it up the way we're praying. I've been praying for Thomas this way. All of a sudden, I found out I need to pray for this way. There are times. There are times when I can't pray for myself. There are times when I can't pray for my wife. And I can't pray for my children because I'm too involved in it. Because I'm too connected to it. Because when I see the temperature goes up to 104, or I see Brenda in pain in the hospital, and I guess I may be messed up when she was there. When I see that, I want to get involved. <laughs> I want to... Uh, the doctors ain't moving fast enough for me. I'm so connected to the, to the situation. that. I, but you know what I need to do? I need to tell church. All right, guys, I can't pray. I'm in a situation where my mind, I can't connect with God. I need some people that are not as connected as I am to begin to pray, to begin to get in touch with God, because I need a move for God. There are times when you can't pray for yourself. There are times when you can't ask your family to pray for you, but you need a church. You need to have a group of people that you can trust in, that you can depend on, that when I say, I need prayer, they are going to get down. You know that they're going to fight the devils. They're going to go through the pits of hell. They'll do whatever it takes to, to facilitate your release. You're going to do whatever it takes, praying without ceasing. He was addicted to drugs. But then the church started praying. She was living in fear. But then the church started praying. She got a bad report from the doctor. But then the church started to pray. They had all kinds of financial problems. But then the church began to pray. The church began to pray. And then all of a sudden, God sent, God sent an angel to, to, to alleviate the stress and the anxiety. God sent an angel to drop the chains that bound them up. God sent a job. Whatever it is, God. And God hears one person praying. 
He hears one person praying. But if you change that one person to two people, as I said before, it's exponential. It's not like, well, we get twice or three times. It begins to grow exponentially. Deuteronomy 32 and 30 says, one can, stay, one can chase a thousand, but two can chase 10,000. When you get God to shut up the enemy, when you pray and you get others to pray, the power, the fervency, the fervently that everybody is praying, the power that's in behind that begins to increase exponentially the output of that power. When you're making fervent, effectual prayer. There's a way out of prison today, folks. There's a way out of prison. There's a way out of prison. There's a way out of prison for you. There's a way out of prison for your family, for your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, for your uncles, your aunts, your mom, your dad. There's a way out of whatever that prison is. I don't know what the prison is, but there is a way out of it. But it's going to take a church that's praying. It's going to take a church when you, oh my God, oh my when we come to the realization, when we get that revelation, that light dinging up there, Sister Jewel, when, when, when Paul seen that light come revelate uh, uh, when he was on the road to Damascus, the same kind of light that Peter had while he was in that jail cell, all of a sudden the revelation of the Lord came. Here's the light revelation coming to you, Peter. Here comes your answer. When we get that revelation, that ding moment in our mind, I can pray. I can pray effectually. I can pray fervently. I can get Brother John. I can get other people in the church uh, 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 included on this. And God is going to facilitate my release from this prison? Above all things, we need to be a church that prays. Above all things, that is our relationship with God. He draws nigh to who? Those people that call upon Him. That praise as individuals, but also praise in unity for a single purpose. No matter how helpless the church may have felt, in Peter's circumstance, they knew that they were never without an avenue to get the God of the circumstances involved. They knew that they were never without an avenue. We know that we have a direct connection up in the heaven that we can get the God of the... He's still in the business of moving in our life. God cares about people. I don't know that y'all understand this. I don't know if you really realize this. God cares about you. God loves you. God don't want you suffering. He paid the price. He's, you're the only thing that God shed his blood for. You're the only thing that he came to heaven, to earth for. You're the only one that he's purchased. Your soul, your safety, your peace, your joy... He has given us avenues to all of this. And if you don't have it, there is a way that we can get it, Brother Jerry. He's still in the business of moving in people's lives. He's still in the business of opening prison doors and breaking the chains of bondage. There is nothing that's too hard for the Lord. He may not perform it in an instant miracle, but he may send an angel to comfort someone that's bound up in chains of oppression, that's bound up in chains of depression, that's bound up in chains of anxiety. He may work through a gradual process in an unseen way, just little day in, little day out, as the church continues to pray, just a little bit at a time. It may not be something, you may have to be kept in that prison for a while. You may be kept in there for a but the whole time, all of a sudden, God brings you a peace with it. God brings you a comfort with it that you have, even though it might be grief, even though it might be fear and anxiety, God is able to speak to your heart and says, I want to show you. I want to help you begin to deal with this. I want you to be able to lay down at night and be able to rest and not worry. I want you to not to worry about that ailment. I don't want you to worry about that heart. I don't want you to worry about that mind. I don't want you to worry about that child. I want you to leave it in my hands. And God has the ability to do that. And that is every much. That is every much a miracle as seeing a bone that's broke, healed instantaneously. Peter being able to sleep in the middle of the jail. Peter being able to lay down and sleep in the middle of the jail, Brother Jerry. Being able to rest with chains on him and sitting there, two lazy old soldiers. Being able to lay down, that's as much a miracle. That's as much a miracle as seeing those chains fall off of him. That is as much a miracle that God sometimes, he doesn't calm the storm as the song sings, but he calms the child. That he sends an angel. That just stands at your side. 
And the church is sitting there praying like they did Moses. And they lifted and they said, oh my God, as, a, as Israel was fighting, when Moses' arms would be lifted up, they would win the battle. But when his arms would get tired and they would get worn out, then he would be losing the battle. And then it come Aaron, and I think it was her. They came together, and they, one got on one side, and the other got on the other side, and they brought a rock, and they lifted his hands up. So that that's the church, folks. That is the church. We are Aaron, and we are her. We are, have the responsibility of getting those people's hands, bringing, that, bringing joy into them. While I've got my hands lifted up, I am successful. But there are times when I am so broken down and I am so weary and I'm so, oh, whatever it might be, whatever it is for you, that I need somebody that's going to raise my hands up for me. That I need somebody, and that's what the church's responsibility is. That is our job. That's every bunch of miracle as anything else. We need to pray, believing in the miracle-working power of God. We need to pray, believing that God has angels at his disposal, that he can dispatch at any time that he needs to come to somebody's rescue. We need to pray to deliver, to strengthen, to encourage, to even make a jailbreak if we need to. Deliverance from that prison. God responds to individual prayer, but God expects the church to bind together in prayer, in unity for the needs of the others, for the needs of the church, for the well-being of the church, for the progress and for the growth of the church. Matthew 18, 19 through 20 says, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, if two of you, if two of you today can, can bind together, Brother John, Sister Amy's going through a test here soon. But if you and I can just agree in the name of Jesus on one thing, that it's going to be negative and everything's going to be okay, if we can come to agreements with that, it shall be done. Now, you can be a negative Nancy all you want today, but I choose to believe that. I choose to live my life based on that. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, he's in the midst. Wherever two or three are gathered together, agreeing on anything, God is right there. The strength of the church is multiplied when we pray together to release those that are bound up. The church of the multi, and it's good, it's okay to pray by yourself. It's okay to get in your closet. But that's not the truth, that's, that's individuality. And we're part of a body. You can go off and be a, an individual all you want. That's fine. You do that. But when the storm comes, you better have a little piggy that's built him a good house on the foundation that you can run to for safety sometimes. Corporate prayer for a common purpose strengthens us as the church as we focus upon what we need. And whether it's for you or whether it's for another we need to know that we can trust, and I can, I can trust, and I can bring forth. A, I'm bound up in this today. I meet up with fear. I meet up, I'm addicted to, I'm addicted to Fox News. <laughs> I need deliverance from Fox News. I'm addicted to the Internet. I'm struggling. All I'm wanting to do is earn money. That's all I want to do. I don't want to come to church. I just earn money. I, don't, I, I need help with this. And we need to be man enough and woman enough to know that when I come to somebody and I give them, I'm bound up in this, that I know that I can trust them, that they're going to pray, that they're going to pray for me. They're going to pray and help me get released from whatever this is, no matter what it is. I'm closing this morning, and I want to do something a little bit different this morning. With great power comes what? Great responsibility. With great power comes what? Great responsibility. I'm a Spider-Man man, so okay. With great power comes great responsibility. We've got great power. We've got a great God. We got a great church. We got a great group of people. We've got a great building. We've got a great elders. We got great prayers. We got great singers. We've got greatness. But with that greatness comes a responsibility that it's not just about me, that it's about all of us. We're not meant to walk this journey alone, folks. We're not meant to walk this journey alone. And we need to realize that, Brother Thomas, I don't even know why you put added that in the back end of your Sunday school lesson. 
talking about how we're here together for each other. It didn't even go with your lesson, but I was like, thank you, God, that it actually hit on mine just a little bit. You may, not, you may be sitting there wondering, I don't know why I put that in there. <laughs> but we need to realize that we're here for each other. You need me, and I need you. You may not think you need me. You may not think you need the person that's beside you. You may not think you need the person behind you, but you need them. You need them. There's going to come a day when the storms are going to come, and you're going to need them to pray for you. We need each other for this body to grow. We need each other for this body to function properly because I'm not a pinky toe. I might be a pinky toe. I don't know. I don't know what part of, of the body I fall into. But if I'm not a pinky toe, I need a good functioning pro pinky toe to be for the church to grow and to operate properly. And when one of us is bound, when one part of us is suffering, the church is supposed to be suffering. When my knee is hurting, all of my body's hurting. I'm not walking right. I'm not able to function. I'm not able to do things. Church, we're called to pray for one, uh, one another for whatever the need might arise, whether it's freedom whether it's healing, whether it's salvation, we need to learn to pray together. We need to learn to pray with urgency, with fervently, with effectually. We need to learn to pray with faith, believing that God has the power to move in any situation. We need to pray with persistence, knowing that the answer may not come right away, but trusting that it is going to come. We need to pray. We need to learn to pray expecting God to move. We need to be able to pray expecting, knowing that God, we have a God that still works miracles. Because if you're not praying the right way, your prayers are not going to get answered. If you're not praying the proper method of prayer, if you're not praying with faith, if you're not praying effectually and fervently, they are not going to avail much. This morning, the altar, I'm closing. The altar is open this morning to anybody that feels like they need repentance. It's always going to be open. We'll pray for you, knowing that you can receive the formula of forgiveness, of salvation. You can repent. You can be baptized. We'll find a creek somewhere for you. We'll throw, if you wait 45 minutes, we'll put water back here in the baptismal. It might be cold, but we'll baptize you. But I feel like we have people that are bound up this morning. I feel like we have people that are bound, either whether it be mentally, whether it be emotionally, whether it be spiritually, that they're in some kind of a prison. And I feel that. I don't feel like that God would give us a message like this for no reason whatsoever. That's right. It's tough to step out in front of a crowd and say, I'm in a prison. It's tough to step out into a crowd and say, I'm grieving. It's tough to stand out in front of people and say, I'm struggling. It's tough to step out in front of people and say, but that's your part. You're supposed to do your part. I'm supposed to do my part. And then God does his part. That's the body working together, Brother Cherry. That's us this morning. If I feel like I'm bound, I'm going. There's been times in my life when I have thought, I'm going to go it by myself. I'm going to do it on my own. But if I would have gotten the church involved, if I would have got the people of God involved, it could have been so much easier on me. The early church showed us that it takes the church to pray to accomplish some things. And we don't know to pray unless you tell us, I need prayer. It's hard to step out and say, I need help. When, and expect the church to help you when you ain't told the church, I need help. <laughs> oh, y'all supposed to be spiritual and you're supposed to know all this stuff. No, it don't work that way. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess it can. It can, but sometimes you're supposed to do your part. You don't have to give the specifics. You don't have to tell people. Just let the church know that I'm struggling. I've got, I've got something I feel like I'm bound. You can grab somebody. You can grab somebody to hand. You can have them come pray with you. You can pray for them, whatever it might be. You can tell them what it is, or you can just simply say, I feel like I'm in chains today. I feel like I've got some bound up somehow. Now. Yes. And we've got people here that's going to pray for you. We've got people here that's going to pray with you. I've had times again, as I said, I've had to go it alone. I feel like it. And, it. and you know what that is? That's just loneliness is what that all that is. All that is is just being alone, but we're not an island here. And I don't want to do that anymore myself. And God doesn't want you either. This morning, I want to pray for a jailbreak. <laughs> I want to pray for a jailbreak. I want to pray for some change that are loosened 
and that are set free. This morning, if you feel like you are bound up, if you are, feel like that you are in a prison, whether it's a mental, if there, don't, here comes Sister Brenda. She's going to be the first one. I like a person that leads by example. I, whatever it might be, whatever it might be that you feel, this is not a judgmental prayer. I'm just going to tell you, you better not be judging anybody that comes up to this altar. This morning, if you're feeling like you are bound up, that you are in a prison, you don't have to tell me what it is. You don't have to tell whoever. Grab somebody else by the hand. Pray with them. Pray for them. Have them pray for you you, but let the church pray this morning. Let the church pray that we are released from this prison and that God breaks these chains. Lord Jesus.